I'm Jacob Kruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay podcast. As you know, on this podcast, rather than looking at movies in terms of loved it, hate it, two thumbs up, two thumbs down, we look at movies in terms of what can we learn from them as screenwriters. We look at good movies, we look at bad movies, we look at movies we loved, and we look at movies we hated. Now, today's going to be a special episode of the podcast because I'm going to be talking about something that I haven't spoken about a lot. Recently, in one of my classes, a bunch of questions came up about horror movies, about how these horror movies are built, about what makes horror movies work and what makes horror movies not work. And so today, rather than talking about one movie, we're going to be talking about three different horror movies. And for those of you who are not horror writers, we're going to be talking about what makes genre movies work in general. So whether you're writing a romantic comedy, an indie film, a thriller, a cop movie, straight horror, comedy horror, mystery, you name it, we're going to be talking about what makes these kinds of movies work. How are they built? And we're going to be looking at three movies. We're going to be looking at Dawn of the Dead, We're going to be looking at Seven, and we're going to be looking at Drag Me to Hell. So what we need to know first about horror movies, horror movies get a bad name. And and the reason horror movies get a bad name is because a lot of horror movies aren't really that good. I like to think that there are basically two different kinds of horror movies. There's your standard gross-out horror movie where it's really just about the violence, about creating a progression of increasingly horrible images and getting the highest possible body count you can. And these horror movies have a very simple formula. You basically establish a bunch of characters and a bunch of relationships, and then one by one you kill off those characters with the greatest efficiency and bloodiness you possibly can. And all the creative work in those movies really just goes into creating the most horrible of horrors. All of the creative energy goes into finding the most disgusting, horrible, frightening, oh my god, I, this is going to haunt me in my dreams, oh my god, I can't unsee that kind of moments. And those moments are all well and good. But the best horror movies actually try to do something much bigger. The best horror movies are usually either psychological commentaries or political commentaries or sometimes a mixture of the two. For example, Dawn of the Dead, both the original 1970s movie and the remake, are actually about consumerism. There's a reason they're stuck in that shopping mall because the horror of their situation is really just a metaphor for the horror of consumerism in the way it makes zombies of all of us. And this is important because most of us are never going to find ourselves in a real-life horror movie situation. We are never going to be attacked by zombies. We are never be going to be cursed uh, with some spirit that follows us. We are never going to actually encounter a real-life serial killer. This is not going to happen for most of us. So if a horror movie is going to do more than just gross us out, if it's truly going to scare us in a way that shakes us to our core, if it's really going to haunt us, then it's got to relate in some way to the real-life experiences of our lives, to our real fears, our real anxieties, our real concerns, our real struggles, the things that actually matter to us. And when you tie your movie to something real, when you tie your crazy fiction, your crazy horror to something real, it becomes a guiding principle for you as a writer. And believe it or not, this can actually help you stimulate your creativity. There's an idea that a lot of writers have that creativity comes from freedom. But that's not always the case. Because sometimes the freedom of the blank page, when truly anything can happen, Sometimes the freedom of being able to think of any element for how your killer kills somebody or how your curse works. Sometimes the freedom of having too many choices actually makes creativity difficult. Sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the sheer variety of our choices 
that it becomes actually very hard to boil our movies down to the essence of what they are really about. And this makes it actually hard to be creative. Creativity is actually a state of hyper-focus where we're able to put the full power of our subconscious mind towards delving into one moment or one event or one scene or one act or one theme. So when you develop these guiding principles, when you understand what your movie is about, something much deeper than a bunch of people get hunted by zombies or a girl gets cursed or a serial killer kills people, When your focus of creativity is based on something that's real in you, that's something that you're really wrestling with, you can actually start to get more creative about your genre. When you realize this is what it's really about, it allows your subconscious mind to focus all its energy on creating those kinds of moments. It helps you understand what kind of horror you need to create. What should be scary about this moment? What should be horrific about these events? Seven's a great example. And I was thinking about Seven recently because I, I recently read uh, an interview with Andrew Kevin Walker, uh, the writer of Seven. And he said something that surprised me because it's not something you hear a lot from really great professional writers. And what he said was, he said, I like to know where I'm going when I write. I like to know what, what the ending is going to be before I start writing. And it may surprise you that that's not a common thing you hear, but most really great writers know that writing is, a, is really a journey and not just a destination. So I was curious about what he meant when he said that he needed to know where it was going. And he started to talk about Seven. And one of the things he said about Seven that I found fascinating, he said, This is what it meant to know where he was going. He knew there were seven deadly sins. And he knew the character ended with wrath. He knew he wanted to move the character to wrath. And for him, that was what it was really about. He didn't know the plot. He didn't know all the events. He didn't know the full outline. He didn't know exactly how it was going to happen. He didn't know the head in the box. He didn't know the murder. He didn't know John Doe. He didn't know all that, but he knew what it was really about. So when you know what it's about, you know what you're building. When you know what you're building, you know what to focus on. When you know what to focus on, you can get creative. Seven is about sin. It just so happens that Seven is a horror movie about sin that contains some of the most gruesome horror scenes ever shot on film. And yes, you could even argue that Seven is a cop movie, or a psychological horror, or even a serial killer movie. But the name of the genre doesn't really matter. What matters is we have a, a movie filled with very specific genre elements. But Seven, despite all of these genre elements, despite each crime that grosses you out more than the last one, Seven is actually about sin. Why? Because it's called Seven. It's about the seven deadly sins. But when you build a movie like Seven, you don't just want it to be about the external hook. You don't just want it to be about a serial killer recreates the seven deadly sins. Because I promise you, before Seven was ever created, 500 other writers also wrote seven deadly sin movies. It's just not that original of an idea. The thing that makes Seven great is not that it's a seven deadly sins movie. The thing that makes Seven great is that it's an exploration of the real role of sin in our lives and who we really are in relation to sin as opposed to who we'd like to think we are in relation to sin. The thing that makes Seven a great movie is that Seven is a movie about a question. Are the sinners really different from us? Is there such a thing as innocence or do we all carry sin inside of us? Are we all capable of true evil? And if that's true, if we are, then is the world actually worth saving or fighting for? And this doesn't come from some external idea, as Andrew Kevin Walker has spoken about. This came from real feelings he was at, having at the time, feeling like he was living in an ugly world and not sure how to make sense of it feeling like he wanted to give up on his writing career as he struggled in an industry where people didn't seem to care about anybody. 
The idea of the Seven Deadly Sins movie is just a metaphor for the real thing the writer is feeling. And that's what makes Seven a great movie, and that's what makes Andrew Kevin Walker a great writer. Being a great writer is not about manipulating your audience around a theme. Being a great writer is finding a theme that's already resonant in you and allowing your creative mind to hyper-focus on that theme, to wrestle with it and explore it and delve into it, putting something honest about yourself on the page. If you think about Seven, you realize the thing that actually makes this movie so great are the main characters' journeys. And in this film, there are two main characters played by Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman, and they go on parallel journeys. Morgan Freeman's character, Somerset, begins the movie believing that the world is full of sin and that there's no difference between us and them, the sinners and the innocent. He's an old man who has seen so much horror in his life that he's basically decided, you know what, this is not a world worth living in. This is not a world worth saving. It's simply a world I want to escape from. He represents the part of Andrew Kevin Walker that wants to give up. And at the beginning of Seven, all Somerset wants is to get out of the police force. It's actually even more clear in the script than it is in the movie. There's a little cottage he wants to buy where he can live like a hermit and escape from this horrible, sinful world that he sees every day as a cop. And he wants to do this because he believes at the beginning of this film that there is truly no moral compass in the universe. Brad Pitt's character, Mills, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. Mills is the young, dumb cop who thinks there are good guys and bad guys, good and evil. Mills believes that they are different than us. That people like him and Somerset are not capable of the kind of evil perpetrated by the man they're chasing. Mills' journey, to put it in Andrew Kevin Walker's words, is the move to wrath. Mills' journey is that he ends up committing exactly the kind of wrathful evil he thinks he could never embody. When he discovers his wife's head in the box and is pushed to a place in himself that he didn't know existed. Somerset's journey, despite seeing all the horrors and all the evils of the world, is to ultimately decide that this is a world worth saving and to come back to his work. Isn't that an interesting structure? You have one character who is actually learning that he is evil in him and that he is capable of killing in cold blood out of vengeance. And then you have another character who is learning that despite all the evil in the world, there may be things and people in the world worth saving. And then finally, you have a third character, the serial killer, John Doe, played by Kevin Spacey. And all this character wants is to show the world what evil is. He wants to expose the hypocrisy of a world that thinks that they do not commit the seven deadly sins every day. By his way of thinking, certainly not by ours, he is the hero, exposing the hypocrisy of the world through these seven crimes. And he exists to test Brad Pitt's, to test Mill's belief system about the world and about himself. You probably remember the moment in the movie where John Doe, the killer, actually has the opportunity to take Mills' life. And instead of exacting his vengeance, the killer chooses to let him go. What better way to test Mills' belief that they are different than us than when this merciless guy shows his mercy? What better way to frustrate Mills' beliefs about what motivates these people and how a person like this will act than having this character later turn himself in as part of his moral crusade? In a lesser movie, in every standard cop formula, the criminal gets caught at the end of the movie. In this movie, he turns himself in halfway through. Fascinating. So, here's what's important to remember, regardless of what genre you're writing in, is that when you start to realize what your movie is about, it stimulates your creativity. You start to realize, oh, this is just about showing Brad Pitt's character, that he can be evil, and that evil can be good. That's what actually stimulates the creativity to realize, yes, I know what scene I need. The serial killer he's demonizing is going to have the opportunity to kill him and not do it. Or yes, the serial killer is actually going to have the most utopian vision in the whole movie. Your genre elements grow out of what the movie is about, not the other way around. 
This serial killer, unlike the others we've seen in countless other serial killer movies, is not just trying to kill. He is not being evil for the sake of evil. He envisions himself on a moral crusade to end sin. In fact, you could argue that he's the character in the movie with the most utopian vision of all. Whereas Mills is going to lose his utopian vision, and Freeman is going to recover his. So when you start to realize that what this movie is actually about, it stimulates the creativity to understand how to build structure, what kinds of scenes you need, and even how to create the horror moments. This is where those seven genius crimes comes from. Not just from Andrew Kevin Walker being brilliant, but from Andrew Kevin Walker knowing what the movie's about and building around that. You probably remember the amazing monologue when the killer talks about the people that he killed. A woman so vain, she'd rather die than go through the world ugly. A man so fat, you would avert your eyes. He goes through all of these people as examples, not of innocence, but of the ugliness in the world. The ugliness within us with which we treat other people in the world. In this way, Seven is a political movie and a psychological movie, and all the crazy things that its main characters do are actually an expression of something very real, an expression of that very real feeling about the world that Andrew Kevin Walker, the writer, has. That these ideas don't come from somewhere outside of us, that they come from inside of us if only we can find the way to look for them. And you can see the same concept in other movies as well. To take more of a traditional horror film, Sam Raimi has a fabulous little horror movie called Drag Me to Hell. And that movie's about greed. Drag Me to Hell is about how just one little moment of wanting something you can have, one little time where we do the wrong thing for money or for success, can ultimately lead us down a slippery slope from innocence to total corruption. The main character in Drag Me to Hell is Christine. And at the beginning of the movie, Christine is absolutely perfect. Those of you who have taken my Write Your Screenplay class have heard me talk about the idea that a character, a main character, is somebody with a problem. And Christine is the opposite of that. Christine is somebody without a problem. She has a perfect little life and a perfect little cat and a perfect little boyfriend. She's a really sweet person, and honestly, you'd want to hang out with Christine. Christine is at peace with the world and at peace with herself. Now, she does have this one little problem, but it's an external problem. It's not a problem inside of her. It's an external problem. Christine's little tiny problem is that she, she's got this awful boss. Christine is very smart, very hardworking, very talented at her job at the bank. She knows what she's doing, and she's good at it. And there's this little tiny part of Christine that's ambitious, but that's not a bad thing, right? It's not bad to be ambitious, especially when you're good at your job and capable. But Christine's boss, well, he's a bit of a chauvinist. And he just doesn't want to promote Christine up the ladder. And if you got a character who doesn't have a problem, what you do is you create one for them. And this is what Sam Raimi does. A gypsy woman comes into her bank, and as you know, if you've ever seen a horror movie, that's already a bad sign. And this gypsy woman asks Christine, she gets on her knees and she begs, please do not take my house. Please do not take my house from me. And Christine, because she doesn't have a problem, because she is a good person, Christine goes into her boss. And she tells her boss, because she's a good person, she says, I don't want to take her house. And her boss says, okay, you don't have to take her house. But I'll know, based on what decision you make, what kind of employee you really are. And then I'll really know how to handle it when time for the promotion comes around. And what do you think Christine does? Christine gets cursed. She's cursed with this creature called the Lamia, which follows her around for three days. And at the end of three days, that Lamia is supposed to drag Christine to hell. Now, this is a pretty good start for a movie. This is a pretty good hook for a movie. But what makes Drag Me to Hell a very successful horror movie 
is that it's not just about some creature dragging her to hell, because we've seen that before. What's fabulous about Drag Me to Hell is it's about how Christine, trying to get rid of this curse, drags herself to hell. It's about watching the slippery slope that begins with that first mistake of morality. And by the time the movie is done, we have watched her, spoilers ahead, we have watched her desecrate a grave, kill that little cat she loves so much, and even try to pass on the curse to her boyfriend. By the end of the movie, it's not the Lamia that drags Christine to hell. It's Christine. That's what makes Drag Me to Hell such a satisfying movie and such a haunting movie for us as the audience. Because most of us are never going to be cursed by a gypsy woman and are never, ever going to be haunted by a Lamia. But every single one of us has to sit down and make choices between our greed, between our ambition, and our morality every day. Every one of us has felt the feeling of slipping down the slope from who we want to be to who we sometimes become. And once you, as the writer, realize, oh my God, Christine needs to drag herself to hell, then it's easy to think about what these horror moments need to look like. And it's easy to think structurally about what each of your acts must be. Because each of your acts is simply one step toward dragging yourself to hell. Just like each of the seven acts in seven is about more than just a murder. Each of the seven acts in seven is about how does Mills move towards wrath and how does Somerset move towards hope. Each of your acts in Drag Me to Hell is simply a step towards dragging herself to hell. And it all needs to start with something small and it needs to get worse and worse and worse. And then each act needs to contain some kind of big pressure that forces this sweet innocent girl to make the next corrupted decision. This is what it means to know what your movie is about. This is not what it means to know where you're going with your movie. And this is what, what it means to know where to focus as you develop your genre elements. These are not external ideas or external formulas you impose in your movies. These are deeply rooted feelings and questions and fears and concerns that we explore in our movies. Drag Me to Hell is not about the horror of greed. It's about the mundaneness of greed. It's about how that little spark of ambition can change us. And even though the things that are happening to Christine in Drag Me to Hell are exaggerated and magical and horrific, the things that lead her to those corrupt choices are the same kinds of real-life ambitions and real-life survival instincts that any and all of us share. The movie works by taking Christine and putting her in situations where any of us would make the same decision she does. Where any of us would choose the wrong thing in the face of this kind of horror. And showing us how our one tiny bit of greed, when magnified by the fear for our survival, can change us into something unrecognizable to ourselves. Horror movies are not the only genre movies. All movies are genre movies. A romantic comedy is a genre movie. An animated film is a genre movie. A love story is a genre movie. Even an indie film or an art film is a genre movie, simply serving a different genre god. They're all genre movies, and they're all going to have genre elements around which they are built. In the series world, Girls is a genre series. It has its unique genre elements, and Orange is the New Black is a genre series. And it has its unique genre elements. They all have their own unique genre elements that they serve in every act and every episode, to which the writers turn their creativity and their focus. Because these are the genre feelings that we want to experience as we write these movies. These are the feelings that our audiences want to experience as they watch them. But to create the truly great genre elements is not simply an exercise in uncharted creativity. The thing that holds these successful films and these successful series 
together. The thing that allows the writer to make it through 105 pages or 13 episodes or five seasons and allows you as the writer to know exactly what is of the movie and what is not of the movie is something much deeper than genre. It's theme. The thing that the movie is really about for you. The question you're wrestling with in yourself. The fear that keeps you up in the middle of the night. The way that you wish the world would be, or you fear the world is becoming. Theme is the secret story that you're telling underneath the surface of your movie. And honestly, most of your audience is not going to get it. Most of your audience is going to watch the movie and go, Oh my god, that was a gross out awesome horror movie! And most of your audience, just like most of your producers, will never realize that the reason they chose this movie as opposed to the other, the reason that this movie was made as opposed to the other, was because they felt the movie differently. Because it spoke to something in them that was deep under the surface that went beyond their creativity and spoke directly to their real-world life. Because you did the work thematically on yourself, they will feel that there is a consistency to it, that there are rules to it, that there is something that makes sense about it within the magic, within the horror, within the genre. They will feel that there is an order holding together the chaos. And more importantly, you will feel it. It will be so much easier for you to be creative and make choices because you'll know what you're really building, where to focus your creativity, and what matters most to you. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. If you want to learn more about building movies organically in any genre and bringing the themes that matter most to you to the surface in your writing, then please check out my upcoming Write Your Screenplay workshops in New York City and online. Or visit my website, www.writeyourscreenplay.com.